Hey guys, my name is Nicole. Welcome back to my channel. I have an antique booth called Green Onion Vintage and one of my biggest questions that I get is how do I decorate my own antique booth? I know a lot of you guys watching me have a booth somewhere, maybe at a vintage market, an antique mall, or maybe at a store similar to mine which is like a smaller antique boutique which kind of allows you to do a mixture of handmade goods and new items as well as antiques and refinished furniture. So that's kind of the, the place that I'm dealing with. Um, it really has a lot of flexibility, but I always get asked, you know, how do I know what to display? How do I know how to arrange things? So today I'm going to give you just an example of a vignette that I would make in my own booth. And I'm going to kind of talk you through the things that I typically look for when I am arranging. So first would be to have a really nice foundation piece. So today, my example, I have this farmhouse table. Um, but having just kind of an anchor piece for your booth is really important. In our booth, we typically have many uh, refinished antique furniture pieces, whether they be wood or painted. Um, and so we just kind of let that be our starting point. From there, I like to create my backdrop. So this is what I'm going to be building my display in front of. And so today, I have these uh, rather large antique shutters that I recently upcycled in my last Cricut video. You guys need to go back and watch that one if you haven't seen it yet. So I did just add the wreath and the ribbon to these after I stained them nice and dark. And I'm gonna be using these as my backdrop and they are really a good backdrop because they're nice and tall. So they add a lot of um, height to my space. And when I am working in my antique booth, I really wanna use all the real estate that I'm paying for. So I always work from floor to as high up into the ceiling as I can. After I have my backdrop, I start to work on the floor. Like I just said, you want to be using all that space. You are paying for it. So today I'm using these picnic baskets to kind of give me um, something to build up on on the floor. So now that I have these down here, I can start leaning things on them. I can start stacking my smaller items on these picnic baskets. So it's really important to kind of have something that you can put here to kind of fill that floor space, but also give you places to display your smaller items. And then I also pulled in this green chair because I can build some small little displays on the chair as well. And everything in my booth is always for sale. I wanna note that it's not on my list, but I never have anything in my booth that is not for sale. You are paying for that space and you want the things in your space to be for sale. I've actually heard a lot of people be discouraged when they're shopping and they see a really cool piece of furniture, especially in somebody's booth. Um, and when I worked at the shop a lot and I had to tell people like, I'm sorry, that's not for sale, that vendor doesn't want to sell that item. People kind of get really discouraged and even upset because they really want to come there to shop as well as be inspired for, de for decor. But if they see something they want to buy and they can't buy it, I don't know, it's just kind of frustrating to the buyer. So I think that if you're paying for the space, everything in your booth should be for sale. That wasn't on my list, but I did want to add that in there. Um, now that I have stuff on my floor, my backdrop, and my foundation piece, I move on to my smalls. Um, now in my store, I'm not very limited. Like I was saying before, I can put in my handmade crafts. I can put in new items that I want to wholesale or things that I've just found along the way. Something that goes well with my style that I really want to curate into my booth. My booth is a reflection of my own style in my own home and I would never sell anything that I wouldn't also purchase for myself but it also means I have to be really selective about the smalls that I have and I want everything to be kind of my brand and my style and to reflect how I truly decorate at home. And so I am kind of picky in that, but I also don't limit myself. If I see something at Michael's or TJ Maxx and it's on sale and I feel like I could add a couple dollars to it for a profit, I won't profit much, but I do like having those smalls in there to give you guys an idea of what my style is and to make my booth look complete and curated well. So add in your smalls, have a mixture of things, um, I, I like to have as many antiques as possible, but I also do a lot of upcycled projects and sell those in my booth as well. So I really just have a mixture. You just want to make sure that you have a lot. You want to have a lot for people to choose from. So I'm adding in my smalls now. And then my sixth tip would be when adding in your smalls, keep in mind your style, like I just said, but also a really good color story. So you want to have your color story really meld together and complement each other and I think that's what really um, takes people's breath away when they walk into a space and they just feel like everything goes so well everything's nice and cohesive we get so many compliments on our booth and I think it's because we really do choose items that just go well together we're never putting something in just for the sale we really are choosing things that we love and I say we because I do this booth with my mom if I didn't mention that already 
Um, so our booth looks very nice and cohesive because we pick pieces that we truly love and we're trying to kind of make everything look nice together. It does kind of just turn out that way most of the time that the things that we like also go well with the other things that we like. I imagine that, but it does, it, if you are struggling with that and you're not sure why your booth looks off, it might just be that you're having too many colors at once. Or if you want to have more than one color, that's completely fine, but you're going to want to make maybe more mini vignettes rather than a larger one like I'm showing you today. So if you wanna have maybe a pink section and maybe do like a little shelf that has all your pink items and then um, maybe on the other side of your booth you're gonna have a green section but to have them all jumbled together can be really confusing for a shopper and it can actually cause them to skip over your booth because they don't wanna have that mental tr struggle to search through your booth. Now there are shoppers who kind of like that and they kind of like the hunt so I'm not saying it's absolutely wrong there is a style of antique booth that, which would be called the flea market style. And that's when there's not really decor in mind. It's more just, you know, you're in there for the hunt of the antique and that's fine. I'm not at all bashing that or saying that that's something you should not do. But if you are wanting a more curated style like my booth has, which has made us really popular, I would say that your color story is really, really important. And to try to make everything cohesive, is going to serve you really well. After the color story, I would say my seventh tip is, and I kind of already said this, I mean, everything's really kind of intermingled together, but I would, I would suggest that number seven is to decorate your booth as if it's your home. So I like to display pieces as if I would display them in my house. And, and that gives me kind of a good mindset so that I stay away from that flea market style. Like I said, it's not a bad thing, but I am trying to kind of show people what these pieces could look like if they took them home to their own house and how they could display them because I know not everybody has an eye for interior design and I completely understand that. That's how I feel when I go outside into my garden. I have zero ideas. I don't know what to do. I don't know where anything should go. And so I know that people feel that same way when they walk into a house. So I like that I have that skill and I would like to share that with other people. You know, everybody is good at different things and if you struggle with interior design, I like people to come to my booth and kind of have some ideas of all of a sudden of what to do with certain things. So I do try to design my booth as if I was at home, display things in a way that people could just pick it up, take it straight to their home and then put it down and it already looks great. Now realistically, in terms of sales, I can't have my booth as sparsely decorated as my home would actually be. So I like to start out my booth as if I was home, but then I really, I just have to add in more inventory. It doesn't make sense for me to have only a few things on display. And so once I kind of have a good setup, then I do start adding in my extra small items so that the booth has enough inventory to make me some money. So that would be my number eight tip is to, once you kind of have everything decorated, you do need to go in at that point and add in, kind of fill in the blank spaces with more small things that you can sell. Number nine, this is a design tip, less of a, less of a booth inventory or good sales tip. Um, design wise though, you're gonna wanna make sure that your booth has a mixture of textures. So by that I mean we want wood, we want painted items, we want metals, we want linens. Um, we really like to add things like old books in there just for like the old papery texture. We like to have some things that are distressed, some things that are more modern, um, things that add shine, like I said, the metals or mirrors or windows. Um, we have, have a lot of copper. We've even done um, like tarnished silver. The mixture and the balance of hard and soft and shiny and matte. Um, that's what really makes a booth look pulled together and intentionally designed. For my number 10 tip, in addition to having a mixture of textures, you also want to have a mixture of price points. And this is more of a business tip and less of a design tip. But you do want to have maybe something for everybody who comes to your booth. You want to have items that can be an impulse purchase for somebody who just kind of dropped into the store. And they, they just want to grab something small. Maybe it's a gift or maybe it's just they want something from your booth because they really like it. They don't want to spend a ton of money though necessarily. So make sure you have items in your booth that reflect your style, but that aren't very expensive because you want to have those items that people can just grab as they're shopping. Just kind of like a fun little uh, doodad, like a little antique uh, pitcher like we have a lot of, or a piece of copper or a handmade sign. Um, we like to have those things at a lower price point. Now, we also have things at a very high price point, and those are gonna be purchases that people are planning on, they've been thinking about it, they've measured the space, that typically tends to be like a larger piece of furniture for us. Um, and so having those 
very inexpensive items all the way up to the expensive items. It helps you make money. The smalls is what everybody always says. Your smalls are what is going to make you rent. So those little purchases that kind of happen every day, those are the purchases that pay your rent. But where you start to really make your money is on your larger purchases, or I should say your larger sales. So you want to make sure that you have the inventory that kind of covers all of those different price points. So I actually do really well with my middle of the line sales. So my more expensive signs and like window DIY upcycling projects, the things that are kind of in the like 70 to $100 range, I do really well in that sector. Now I almost always have a very small sale every single day, something like eight to $10. Those are daily for me. The middle pieces on a normal month, I can't say COVID, we've had a very normal month in a long time, but before COVID happened, I would have more of those middle sales a couple times a week and then a larger furniture sale a couple times a month. And that would really end up being a nice month for me, um, probably in the ballpark of 600 to $900. It's pretty typical for me. I just want to point out before I let you go, I forgot to stress how important florals are to the texture and color of a booth. You can see that when I added the florals, it really tied everything together. Also adding the pops of different colors of pumpkins kind of across the booth so that you're complementing colors all the way across. As in, I'm thinking especially like this reddish pumpkin right here, complementing this kind of orangish red sign, this greenish pumpkin complimenting my little spooky like insect poster and even the green of the chair so just kind of creating balance in that way but florals really help tie the booth together in the end and then i love the pops of metal it's kind of hard to see on camera but in real life like those brass frames in the back and then the silvers they really bring your booth to life they give you something to catch your eye and then of course i like mixing kind of the modern fonts with all the signs that i've made here and I made all these signs in my recent DIY upcycling video if you want to hop back and watch that one. I have a really big Q&A video planned that's coming up very soon. It is all about my tips for running an antique booth and it answers all the questions that you guys had for me online on my Instagram and here on YouTube. So that's going to be a really informative video. If you haven't subscribed yet, I recommend doing that, especially if you also have an antique booth, because I think you're going to find that video really interesting. And I'd love to hear your feedback about what I speak on in that video as well. I hope you liked today's video. Let me know your vignette making tips if you also have an antique booth. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Bye, guys.